God's peace be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus left the district of Tyre and went down to the Sea of Galilee, into the district of the Ten Cities. People brought to him somebody who was deaf and could not speak. They begged Jesus to put his hand on the man and cure him. He took the person off by himself, away from the crowd. And then Jesus put his finger into the deaf man's ears and spitting, touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven and he groaned and he said, Afatha, be opened. Immediately the deaf man's ears were opened and he lost his speech impediment and he spoke very plainly. Then Jesus ordered them not to tell anybody, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they proclaimed it. They were exceedingly astonished and they said, he has done everything so well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The Gospel of the Lord. When we were first at Corpus Christi Church, the church building on Main Street was not accessible for people in wheelchairs. And some parishioners were insisting that we make it accessible, that we build a a wheelchair ramp. Others resisted and they said, look at this beautiful building that's been here for 90 years. It was made so beautiful. Why do we have to blast a hole in the side of the church and build this ugly ramp? And unfortunately, I have to say, I was uh, resisting it a little bit too. But then I came to the, I had to preach on the reading that we had, the one that Rich uh, read today, and that completely changed it. This is the letter from James. James is the brother of Jesus who ran the early church in Jerusalem, and they think that he wrote this letter. So James talks about two people who come to a religious gathering. One is dripping with gold, just finely dressed, really rich. The other is a homeless person in tattered clothing. So the first one is greeted very warmly. Oh, come, sit right here. Sit in the front seat. But the homeless person in tattered clothes is told, you can stay over there. And immediately the light went on. We made the connection with people in wheelchairs because basically what we were saying in that church that was not accessible, you people who can walk, you can sit right here in the pews. And you people in the wheelchairs, you can stay outside. And James says very clearly, you can't show partiality like that. Don't you know that the people that, that you meet, where you meet Christ, are the very people that you are excluding? And uh, so we built the, the ramp, and immediately the group homes showed up. You build it and they will come, right? And we are so blessed, like the Heritage Christian Homes, uh, Nancy and Yeva and Sue, they're not, they're not here today, but they often sing in the choir, and Tom sits back there. 
but we are so blessed with the Heritage Christian Homes. The letter of James is the first scripture to condemn profiling. Profiling. That means separating people by their outward appearances. And James clearly says you are not to show partiality like that according to outward appearances. So speaking of profiling, you probably saw in the news this week uh, that story about Colin Kaepernick. He was the San Francisco quarterback that was the first one to kneel during the national anthem to protest racial profiling, protest police brutality against African Americans. He started that whole movement. And Kaepernick suffered from that, from the consequences, because there were consequences of speaking up against racism. He's been blackballed by the NFL. Nobody's hired him since. He has no job. The President of the United States said people like that that protest should all be fired. However, this week he was vindicated. Nike named him Valuable Athlete, and he became the... <laughs> he became the face of a Nike ad promoting the slogan, Just Do It. And it shows his face with the caption, Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And last Tuesday, the NFL issued a statement. They said, the social justice issues that Colin and the others have raised deserve our attention and deserve action. NFL. <laughs> Colin Kaepernick is an example of somebody who refused to be deaf to the cries of the African American people, and he refused to be speechless against injustice. So he heard the cries and he spoke out against it. And that's what the gospel is about today. Jesus heals a person who is both deaf and speechless. He can't hear, he can't hear the cries of the poor, and he can't speak. He can't speak out against it. So this is a very important story for all of us. The people asked Jesus to lay his hand on this deaf person's head and, and heal him. Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he takes him off by himself, away from the crowd, and he puts his fingers in the man's ears, showing that he's willing to touch his infirmity, because in those days, they believed that if you had a handicap like that, you must be cursed by God, there must be something wrong with you, and you are unclean. But Jesus, by touching him, is basically saying, that's a bunch of baloney, you're not unclean, and I'm not unclean by touching you. So he touched him right where he was infirm. And then he does an unusual thing. He spits, and he, touches, he spits and touches the man's tongue with his spit. A firefighter told me, it's not glamorous to drag a drunk guy out of a burning house, throw him on the ground, and swap spit with him as you give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. It's not glamorous, he said, but that's how you bring him back to life. You swap spit. And Jesus was doing that. He was being very intimate with this man and touching his tongue. So after he touches his ears and his tongue, he says he looks up to heaven. So Jesus always counted on God's help. A lot of us, myself included, get going with our burdens every day and we, we fret about things, we get anxious about things, and then, he, and then I say, oh my gosh, I didn't bring God into this. I didn't turn it over to God. What's wrong with me? And as soon as I do that, everything gets better. So Jesus looks up to heaven, and then he groans. He groans. Did you ever notice that in some of these stories that he groans or he cries or he sighs when he heals people? A man I knew very well walked into my office once, and he gave me this news. He said, my, my wife has been unfaithful to me. And my eyes started to fill up with tears. And I said, I wish I could help you. And he said, you've already helped me more than you know. You cried. You know a little of my pain. So Jesus was groaning. He was sighing. He was crying. He was feeling this man's pain of not being able to hear, not being able to speak. Jesus is in solidarity with our broken hearts. When our hearts are broken, when bad things happen to us, he sighs, he groans. He's in solidarity with the elements of the human race. He's not aloof. And so after looking up to heaven and groaning, he speaks out and he says, open up. 
just like God speaks in the creation story. Let there be light. And the man's ears were open, and he began to speak. So his ears were open, he began to speak. What happened first? His ears were opened, then he could speak. We have to hear first the cries of the poor, then we can speak about it. We need to hear a person's story before we speak any judgment. We need to hear both sides of the argument until we can make any conclusion. Today, we are deaf. Many of us are deaf. We need to hear, we need to have our ears opened. Our Mother Earth community here at Spiritus is trying to open our ears to the cries of the Earth over climate change. The Earth is crying out, and we need to hear it. The high school kids in Florida are trying to open our ears to the cries of children shot and killed with automatic assault rifles that are still legal in this country. The proponents of the Me Too movement are trying to open our ears to the cries of mistreated and oppressed women. Last Monday, 44 of us marched with farm workers in the Labor Day Parade. We're trying to open the ears of the politicians to the cries of farm workers who lack basic rights and basic benefits, like having a day off once a week. And yesterday, many of us went to the rally at Baden Street. Many of you were there. The choir was there. Myra was speaking. I saw her on TV today. As you know, Spiritus Christi is taking the lead on trying to establish a civil rights park at Baden Street. And this will honor all the local people over the years who have refused to be deaf to racial injustice and who refused to be speechless about it. They found their voice and they spoke up. And we're going to honor those people in the civil rights park. There was a reason Jesus took the man off by himself, away from the crowd. Why did he do that? Jesus wanted the first voice the man heard to be the voice of Jesus. He knew he would hear many voices from the crowd, but he wanted the primary voice in his life to be Jesus' voice. He wanted, to him, he wanted the man to hear his voice first. And it's the same thing today. Jesus wants us to hear his voice first. There are many competing voices in our lives. We call those competing voices sometimes worldly wisdom because on some level they make sense. So for example, here's an example of worldly wisdom. We need to have the death penalty as a deterrent to crime. Or I need to have a gun in my house to keep myself safe. That's worldly wisdom, makes some sense. But God's voice says what? Thou shalt not kill. Worldly wisdom says, what that person did to me is totally unforgivable. We get that. But God's voice says, forgive 70 times 7, no matter what. Worldly wisdom says, I worked hard for my money and I can spend it all on myself. But God's voice says, share your bread with the hungry. Worldly wisdom says, we need to close our borders to keep scary people out. But God's voice says, welcome the stranger. So Jesus is trying to take us off with him, away from the crowd, so we can hear his voice first. The gospel story ends with this. The man's ears were opened, and he spoke plainly. He spoke plainly. What did he say? It's not here. It doesn't say what he said. But I know what he said. It's the same thing people say to me when they come in for confession and have those years of guilt lifted from them. It's the same thing I say to my eye doctor, the one who removed my cataracts every time I see him. It's the same thing each one of us are going to say the moment we die. How can I ever thank you?
try to make it 